All right, so today we have a special brother, yeah. special preacher, all right. special man of God that came all the way from heaven. Yes. And he passed through Tulsa for a while, then he went to Atlanta for a while. Now he's in Houston for us. Yeah. And we're going to open the gift of God. Yes. That is Marty Blackwelder. Yes. Everybody, please stand. Hallelujah. Now, Brother Marty... Uh, has come from a, a place that we hold dear in our hearts that is the most pure and sincere and powerful Bible school that America's ever really known. And so we trust Marty. We love Marty. And he's going to help us today touch a piece of God. Amen. That's right. And so keep your heart really open to the Lord. And uh, we're going to get some big stuff today. Yeah, you know, Marty is, we just want to tell you how he relates to Houston Faith Church. He's been a friend for a long time. When we were small, we were like 40 or 50 people. And Marty was one of the first guest ministers that we had come in the church. And, you know, Marty, he's got a worldwide ministry, he travels all over the world. He's booked every weekend, uh, but he had it in his heart uh, to help us out at Houston Faith Church. And so he's been come regularly since, since the very early days. And I'll never forget, we used to sit across from him at the dinner, and he would say to us, y'all are doing a great job. You know, we'd have 40 people. And he'd say, y'all are doing a great job. You're going to make it. And I would listen. Because I thought this guy travels all over the world. If he says we're going to make it, well, we must be going to make it. And so he's always been very, very special to us as a friend and to the, the church as a friend. So I want you to open up your hearts real big, put your hands together, and welcome Marty. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. Give somebody a handshake or a hug. You can be seated. <laughs> Praise God. We've been with you many times, and I know a lot of you have been here through the years, but how many of you, you know, you've joined uh, in the last two years? Raise your hand up here. Yeah, a good number of people have come to the church in the last two years. So we've got, uh, you know, and three years and four years, so we've got some new people on, on the scene, and then some of the oldies but goodies. Amen. So we're going to revisit some things that we've shared with you in the past. You know, there are certain truths in the Scripture that you just need to revisit periodically because... Uh, quite naturally, uh, we forget. We tend to forget, right? And so there are certain truths, although they're very simple uh, in concept, they're profound in application, which means they can have a tremendous impact on your quality of life as a Christian. So you just need to review them, all right? So I'm going to review some things that we've, we've shared with you in days gone by, and we're just going to have a good time in the presence of God, all right? Turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now listen, my style of teaching, it'll probably be uh, most beneficial. We will not turn and look at every scripture. I'll probably quote a lot. But you can always jot down the scripture and go back and, and look at it later. <clears throat> Come back tonight, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some things pertaining to, to uh, the church and so forth that we've got in our spirit, but this morning we want to go this direction. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, Paul writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'll get there in just a minute, he said these words, now the God of hope, aren't you glad he didn't say now the God of discouragement? Now the God of despair. No. He said, now the God of hope. Aren't you glad when you feel hopeless, you're not hopeless? When it seems like there's no way out, there's a way out. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, right? And all peace. Now, now notice, fill you. That means what? When something's filled, it's at what? Maximum capacity, right? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. 
If you feel a little hopeless, if your, your tank's a little empty this morning, you're in the right place. Because <laughs> we're going to get our tanks full. Amen. So, you know, when Jesus uh, was talking to the disciples up in the upper room, just prior to his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, and his ultimate ascension to heaven, he's up in that upper room with them. He's very well aware that he's departing soon, and they are too, and they're not real happy about it. And so he begins to communicate some things to bring them a sense of encouragement. One of the things he told them, you know, was in John chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 1, he said, Hey, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again. I'll receive you unto myself, and where I am, that's where you're going to be. And then, of course, he told him about this wonderful person called the Holy Spirit, who, who Jesus said, the Father's going to send you a companion, just like I've been. Once I'm gone, you're not going to be alone. He's going to send a companion. Everything I've been to you, a source of counsel and comfort and strength and revelation, he will be to you. And the good news is, he said, he won't just be with you as I have been. He's actually going to take up residence on the inside of you. An internal, eternal companion. A constant source of joy and peace and strength and comfort and wisdom and guidance living on the inside of you. Woo! So he talks to him about that. And then, of course, he talks to him about abiding in the vine. Stay close to me. Let's walk this thing out. And then, finally, in John 15, 11, one of the statements he makes is he said, Now, John 15, 11, these things, all the things he discussed with them, have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. At maximum capacity. He said, I want you to realize I'm about to radically alter your life and existence through my death, burial, and resurrection. And what I'm about to do in you and for you and for all those that, that will believe on me through your testimony is a life that needs to be celebrated. I want you to live your Christian life in celebration of what I'm about to do for you. I want you to walk and live this thing with a sense of joy. Woo! Amen. So, everybody put a smile on your face. So joy, in one sense of the word, is, is what I call joy is at the heart of Christianity. I mean, Jesus bequeathed his joy to the disciples, and he wants you and I to likewise live our lives full of joy. So the Bible says, you know, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, you know these scriptures. When I talk about joy, I'm not talking about a soulish emotion, right? I'm talking about a spiritual force called joy that's been deposited into the recreated human spirit the moment you were born again. And so there is a supernatural strength that is deposited and released into the life of a Christian through this fruit or force of joy. And it's resident within every believer. I mean, every single person, you've got joy in your well, right? You've got peace in your well. You've got strength in your well. You've got wisdom in your well, right in here, the wells of salvation. We just got to learn to draw it out, right? So, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, so forth and so on. And then, of course, over in Romans 14 and 17, how many of you know that scripture? The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That means it's not mere matters of external observance. You'll remember when Jesus spoke about the kingdom. I'm going to have to take this off. I'm a little warm. Uh, I'm skinny, but I sweat. <laughs> so when he said, do you know, talked about the kingdom, he said, hey, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. You remember that scripture? Low here, low there. At this point in time, he said, it's not a visible kingdom in the natural realm. He said, really, it will be, but at this point, it's, it's not. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. So Romans 14, 17 says, this kingdom 
that this rule, this realm that is on the inside of every believer is characterized by three particular characteristics. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Whoa! If anybody in this crazy world we live in should be walking and living with an internal sense of joy and peace, it's you and me. That doesn't mean everything on the outside's going just perfect, right? But it means we've got something on the inside that the world didn't give to us and the world can't take it away, right? So Paul writing on this subject of joy and also peace in Philippians chapter 4, and like I said, this is review, but we, we need to review it. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, remember the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again, he said, in case you didn't hear me the first time, he said, let me repeat myself. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, do you know what the word rejoice means? The word rejoice means to feel and show great joy. So, man, there ought to be something about our countenance that's reflecting what's on the inside. So he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. One translation says, all joy be yours at all times. All joy be yours at all times. Another translation says, always be happy in the Lord. Now, now can you believe that's in the Bible? Rejoice in the Lord always. All joy be mine at all times. Always be happy in the Lord. You've got to be kidding me, man. That can't be in the Bible. How in the world is it possible to, to live in a sense of joy? For joy to be mine at all times when, man, you don't know what I'm going through. Paul said, let me tell you how it's possible. Verse 6. In the King James, Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be careful for nothing. Now, I did a study on, in the Greek on the word nothing. It means nothing. <laughs> be, <laughs> be careful for nothing. But in everything. Now, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Be careful for nothing but in everything. Instead of whining and bawling and squalling and <laughs> In everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving or petition, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. So what's Paul saying? He said, let me tell you something. Joy and peace are going to be most fully realized in the life of a Christian who has learned, and I did say learned because it is a learning process, who has learned to live their lives free from care. He did not say free from responsibility. He did not say free from adversities and oppositions and the sorrows of life that come to all of us and, and the conflicts and the external situations and circumstances. He said free from the care of them. Right? Now, I like uh, the, the Living Bible. I'll just quote it to you. Same verse, cha uh, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Man, that's a tough one. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs. Don't forget to thank Him for the answers. It goes on to say, if you will do this, God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can comprehend or understand, you'll experience that peace. And it will keep your heart and your thoughts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Woo! So, you know, basically, you know, we, we, we say don't worry. Amen. Most Christians would say, you know, the Amplified says don't worry, don't fret, don't have anxiety. You know what the word fret means, don't you? 
Fret comes from the English word fretten, which means to devour like an animal. I mean, that old worry, it'll begin to eat away at you, you know. Don't fret, don't worry, don't have anxiety about anything. Now, most Christians say, amen, don't worry, praise the Lord. They don't even know what worry is. <laughs> now, we've gone over this. Don't even know what worry is. How many of you know what worry is? You remember what we've taught? In days gone by, and your pastors have taught, worry, friends, is meditating in a negative direction. Now, when we say meditate, what do we mean? Reflect, rehearse. Reflect, rehearse. That's meditation. As a Christian, we advocate meditation. We say we need to reflect and rehearse the promises of God, the Word of God. Uh, it's like a dipping a, a tea bag in a hot cup of water. You remember that ex illustration, or maybe you've heard of it? You dip a, uh, a tea bag into a hot cup of water. If you just dip it one time, very little of the flavor or the color of the tea will be absorbed, right? You've got to what? Dip it over and over and over. Well, that's what you do in a positive sense with the Word of God. Let's say you have need of healing in an area. You would just take a scripture, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he bore my sicknesses, my weaknesses, my diseases, and carried my sorrows and pains. He was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement uh, of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I was healed. Right? So you just got that tea bag and you dip it in your water. Then at lunchtime, on your lunch break, you get it out again and you read it. Surely you bore my sicknesses, you carried my diseases and pains, and by the stripes that wounded you, I'm healed. Thank you, Lord. You just dipped your tea bag. Well, at night, before you go to bed, get it out again, read it again, a and dip that tea bag. And you do that for a period of time, dip it over and over and over until all of the life and the creative power that is resident within that living Word of God is absorbed into your human spirit and manifest the very thing it carries. Now that's meditation in a positive sense. But meditating in a negative sense is what we call worry. When you're constantly and we're constantly allowing our thoughts to reflect and rehearse what we call the potential uncertainties of life. Uh, you know, what am I going to do? What if I lose my job? What if I don't get a job? What if I lose my retirement? What if the kids don't turn around? What if I don't get better? What if the money doesn't come? You see what I'm saying? And Satan will come and he will paint on the canvas of your mind portraits of fear, portraits of failure, portraits of the worst case scenario, all with the intention of what? Bringing fear. Bringing fear. Don't you know fear enters through the doorway of the mind? And so when you're rehearsing and reflecting the Word, you're depositing faith and confidence. But when we're worrying and fretting, it's carrying the wrong substance. You're still depositing something, but it's the wrong substance. You're depositing fear instead of faith. And then that fear has a tendency to produce the very thing that you're worrying about. Are you listening? So... He said, basically, if we had to sum up this, this theological revelation in two modern words, it would be, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor, say, don't worry, don't worry. Be, happy. be happy. Turn to your other neighbor, say, don't worry, don't worry. be happy. <laughs> Amen. Now, listen, I don't know. Listen, it amazes me. That the man who wrote these scriptures, he wasn't sitting, you know, in, uh, in a nice bed and breakfast. He was in prison, in an old pit. Pretty nasty from what I understand. When he wrote these words. But this same man, man, he said, hey, all joy be yours at all times. Don't worry, don't fret, don't have anxiety about anything. Now, what amazes me once again is he was no stranger to adversity. I mean, if any, anybody had some stuff going on, man, it was the Apostle Paul. Have you ever read this guy's testimony? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, I'm going to read it to you in the Message Bible. Uh, get ready. Are you listening? 
Paul said, I have worked harder. I've been jailed more often. I've been beaten up more times than I can count. He said, I've been flogged five times by the Jews, 39 lashes. Anybody ever been flogged five times with huh? 39 lashes? No. He said, I've been beaten by Roman rods three times. Anybody ever been beaten with Roman rods? <laughs> He said, I've been pummeled with rocks once. He's been stoned. I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in an open sea for a night and a day, in hard traveling year in, year out. I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storm. I've been betrayed by those that I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery. Hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by the cold and naked to the weather. And he said, and that's not the half of it. <laughs> he said, when you throw in all the daily pressures and anxieties of the churches, he's trying to oversee multiple churches. You can, you can see how that would be, you know, a little stressful. <laughs> and so <laughs> he said, hey, man, I've been through some stuff. We all go through some stuff. I don't think any of us have encountered the degree that the Apostle Paul encountered. I'm not belittling our experiences or the things that we've encountered, but I don't think any of us have, have encountered to that degree. And yet notice this man's attitude. And this is the attitude we've got to face life, friends. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, you can take note of that. Notice what he said. He said, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which was given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. So he said, hey man, I, I know what it's like. I go through stuff, but none of this is going to move me. I'm going to finish this course, and I'm going to finish it with joy. Right? Well, good for you, Paul. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so happy for you. <laughs> what about the rest of us? You know what I'm talking about? How is it possible? Paul said, well, I've learned. I've learned to walk in joy and walk in peace in the midst of the most extraordinarily difficult external situations and circumstances. How do you do it? He said, well, I'm glad you asked me. Verse 8, Philippians 4, 8, he said, now here's your key. Now, you know these things. We're just rehearsing them. We got to remember them. Why? Because they affect your quality of life as a believer in the natural world. He said, now, now here, here's, your, here's your secret. Whatsoever things are true, this is King James, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. He said, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, somebody tell me the last phrase. Think on these things. Paul said, hey, you want to know the secret to living in joy and peace, maintaining internal joy and peace in the midst of the world we live in? Yes, I would. He said, well, I've learned how to think properly, basically. He said, I've learned how to focus my attention properly because I've come to realize, he said, whatever I focus my attention on has the greatest impact on my heart, my joy, my peace, right? My faith, my confidence. Did you know, and I know you realized, but your attention is directly connected to your faith, your joy, your peace, your confidence. That's why the devil wants your attention and mine. He's always vying for your attention. May I have your attention, please? Look at it. It's impossible. Feel it. It hurts. Talk to your wife about it. Tell your friends how horrible it is. May I have your attention, please? And you have to, as we've said, you've got to put up the hand in the realm of the Spirit and say, talk to the hand, buddy. Talk to the hand. You may not have my attention, right? Because 
cross. If you give him your attention, man, he'll wear you out. Right? So Paul said, I've learned to focus my thought life. We, we, we say it this way. You'll never walk in joy and peace on a consistent basis without, an, without a disciplined mind. Now, an undisciplined mind's like an undisciplined child. No boundaries, unruly, headed for trouble. That's an undisciplined mind. No boundaries, no restraints, unruly, headed for trouble. We've got to take control of our thought life and harness our thoughts and bring it into harmony with that which promotes joy and peace. Are you listening? So, you know, some people say, well, I can't control my thoughts. Yeah, you can control your thoughts. Now, if I had a helmet and I just could put it on your head this morning, it was a specialized helmet, and all of your thoughts were projected up on the screen that was up there earlier while I'm preaching and everybody could see your thoughts, I wonder if you could control. <laughs> oh, yeah. What? <laughs> you can control them now. Now, it takes a little effort. Takes a little discipline, but we can do it, can't we? And if we're going to have joy, if we're going to have peace, we're going to have to do that. Control, control our thoughts. So Paul said, hey, listen, I've learned to think properly. Well, what do you think about? He said, well, I'm glad you asked me. And, and you know, you can read the Pauline epistles and see the truths that Paul focused upon. He said, you know, when the mountain seems high and the road seems long, and man, it does at times right? For all of us. He said, instead of focusing on these temporary external frustrations of the moment, and we've all got them, he said, I just tend to think about the fact that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I focus my attention on the fact that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am ready for, I am equal to anything that comes my way through Christ who infuses his inner strength into me. That's the amplified version. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. He said, I just remind myself that when I walk through the water, he'll be with me. And through the rivers, they will not overtake me. When I walk through the fire, I'll not be burned, neither will the flame kindle upon me. I think about the fact that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment shall be condemned. I think about the fact that he has made me more than a conqueror through him who loves me. That thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. He said, I think about the fact that nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God. He said, that's what I keep my attention on. Instead of focusing on all the negatives and we've got them, everybody does. But he said, if that's what you focus on, man, that's what you're going to be engrossed in and it will steal your joy. It will steal your peace. It will steal your faith. It will steal your confidence. What else do you think about, Paul? He said, well, now I'll tell you something else I think about. Uh, not just those internal realities of Christ, but I also think about the hope of heaven and my eternal reward. You'll remember it was the Apostle Paul that penned the words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He said, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I like that. You know, have you ever thought about this? I'll just pause. It's not doctrine. It's just a thought. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, you remember the law of first mention in the scripture when Christ rose from the dead. The Bible says that many of the saints which also slept arose and appeared to people in the city. Matthew chapter 24, you can read it. So obviously there was a little lull in the time period before he ascended and led captivity captive. Here you got all these people running around the street, raised from the dead, appearing to their loved ones and talking to people. You talk about shaking people up. So here's my mom. She passed away about three years ago. She, you know, they, they said they were going to be cremated, so she's on the mantle in an urn. Her body is. 
She's in heaven, but her body. Can you imagine watching funniest home videos and all of a sudden she pops out of there? Calls the dead in Christ rise first and says, honey, here we go. And that gives me a chance to get, all of us get excited. It could be, not preaching doctrine, just saying it could be. Little funny side note. All right, so the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. Paul said, I take comfort in the fact this life is temporary. Any sorrow, persecution, setback, adversity, opposition that I may encounter in this life in reality is light and momentary in comparison to the eternal blessedness that is waiting me on the other side. <laughs> he said, man, that comforts me. This isn't all there is. Stop sweating the bumps in the road. I got some great news for you, man. If you're a Christian and you're sitting in this room this morning, guess what? This is as bad as it gets. I know, but it's been bad. I know, but take comfort in the fact this is as bad as it gets. You've got heaven after this. And the ages upon ages in the presence of God. Woo! Amen. Paul said, man, that brings me comfort. And he said, besides that, I'm running this race realizing at the end of it, there's a reward. Revelation 22 and 12. Uh, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to every man, every boy, every girl, every uh, woman, according as their work shall be. So you know when that trumpet sounds and, and the great tribunal of the church occurs, now we say judgment seat of Christ. Don't get nervous at that. That's, that's, that's not where your sins are judged. They, they've been judged on the cross at Calvary through the blood of Jesus. Uh, this is, means a raised platform. It'll be more or less a, an award ceremony where our works are evaluated and we're rewarded accordingly. And so Jesus said, everything you've done now, and the Apostle Paul comments in 1 Corinthians 3, everything you've done for the kingdom of God and for people because you love God and you love people. I got a little book of remembrance in Malachi. I'm keeping it and you're going to be rewarded. Now, anything and everything you've done for the accolades of men, for the recognition of men, for the pride of life, that's called wood, hay, and stubble, and it will be burned up. So none of us want a bonfire at the judgment seat. <laughs> Brother Marty, poof. No, we don't want that. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know. No, we don't want that, man. We <laughs> so let's just love God. Let's love people. Let's be a blessing to people. And let's do it with a right heart, right? Let's serve in the kingdom and be a blessing to folks. So Paul said, I'm running with that in mind. So 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he said, hey, what does it say? How does it start? <laughs> I have I've run the race, kept the faith, finished my course, right? And he said, because I have, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And he said, not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Man, it's going to be a glorious day. Can you say amen? So Paul said, these are things I focus on. The internal realities of Christ, the hope of heaven, that I'm running this race with a divine purpose. And when I get to the end, if I'll run it with joy and don't whine about it the whole time I'm down here, whoo, he said there's going to be a crown. <laughs> Not just for me, but for everybody. Right on? All right, so let me read you some scriptures now. And I'll tell you something else. Now, don't let your past dictate your present joy. Are you listening? Sometimes people are always looking back, looking back, looking back. I know we've all made bad decisions. We've had broken relationships. We've had loved ones that have passed on. Let me tell you, if your loved ones passed on in Christ, they would not come back if they could. Brother Hagin used to tell us that all the time. He said, now listen, if, if they passed in Christ, they love you, but they don't want to come back. 
He said, believe me, and if you know anything about his ministry, he said, I've been there. He had several visitations. He said, I didn't want to come back. He said, but Jesus made me to finish the course. So they're happy. They're content. Man, every time I think about my mom and I love my mama, boys love their mamas, I just think about how happy she is. And, and man, it just brings me joy. Right on. So don't let the past dictate your present joy. You can't drive forward, as we say, looking in the rearview mirror. Everybody's made mistakes. The Apostle Paul made mistakes. He held the coats of those that stoned Stephen, didn't he? Didn't he drag women and, and men and children out in the streets and bind them to Jerusalem? Yeah. He said, hey, I got some things I'd like to forget I'm not really proud of. He said, this is my philosophy, forgetting the things that are behind reaching to the things that are ahead, right? And that's a good philosophy of life. Stop letting the devil bring up your past. It's in the past and should be forgotten. The future's bright. Psalm 5, verse 11, let's look at these verses real quick. Notice, the psalmist said in Psalm 5, verse 11, let all those that love thy name, excuse me, let all those... Do I have the, yeah, let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice... Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name, somebody tell me, be joyful in thee. So notice, rejoice, be joyful. Now over in Psalm chapter uh, 32, the same verse, verse 11, Psalm 32 and verse 11. Notice what the Bible says. Be sad in the Lord. Is that what it says? <laughs> that's the way some Christians look. You go to some churches, that's the way you think it read. Be sad in the Lord. No, it says be glad in the Lord. And rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy all those that are upright in heart. Let me give you one more. Psalm 35, verse 27, the first portion of the verse, it says... Let them shout for joy and do what? Be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of a servant. But now three verses, there's multitudes. What did we read? Be glad, be joyful, rejoice. Now, does that sound like a suggestion? No. What is it? It's a command. Righteous ones, children of God. Come on, man, you're born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Forgiven. Heaven's your home. Put a smile on your face. Be glad, be joyful, rejoice. So that's a, you know, that's a command. But more specifically, you know, it's a choice. Oh, now we don't like to hear that. Particularly when you're sad, you don't like somebody saying you're sad because you're choosing to be sad. I mean, we just rebel against it because we want to be sad at the moment. You don't know what I'm going through. And, hey, I've had those moments. But, but listen, the Word says, be glad. So it is a choice. And then now here's the specifics again. It's a matter of focus. Focus. Right? Every single person, <laughs> every single person in this room, from, <laughs> from the time you open your eyes in the morning till the time you lay your head down at night, every one of us have taking place on the inside of us what psychologists call and we refer to as internal conversation. You might know it as self-talk. Anybody ever heard that terminology? Self-talk. What does that mean? You talk to yourself all day long. <laughs> it's inaudible, but it's going on. This conversation, you talk to yourself about your husband. You talk to yourself about your wife. You talk to yourself about your friends, your co-workers, your job, what you have, what you don't have, your kids. I mean, this thing's going on all day, right? And for many people, unfortunately, this internal conversation is very negative in content. Everything that is wrong with my life. Because this internal conversation is our personal world and how we perceive it. Right? And so, man, this, that's, that's what's going on up here. Right? And for many people, it's negative. It's like we used to say, a record playing. 
Now we have to say an MP3 or a CD, right? So the alarm goes off in the morning, and track one begins. And for many people, their song sounds like this. Oh, God. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to work. They don't pay me enough. I can't meet my bills. My coworkers get on my nerves. The kids are a mess. Look at the house. My husband's not treating me properly. My wife's not treating me properly. I don't have anything to wear. My hair looks like last year's bird's nest. See what I'm saying? Negative, negative, negative. And it can be different for different people. But what people don't realize, man, is this negative internal conversation is producing a mentality, a mindset. And may I say to you, I've said it before, but the highest form of human captivity is a wrong mentality. The highest form of human captivity, it's a wrong mentality because if I'm thinking improperly about myself, about my situation, about my future, then I'm believing improperly, right? And I'm powerless to change it. So, you know, this, this mentality. And then if you have a negative mentality, it begins to what? Affect your joy, affect your peace, Affect your faith and confidence. And then those negative emotions begin to impact your physiological body. It's just a reality. They're all connected. Now, I know what I'm talking about because, uh, and I'm, I know, I'm sure I've told you this before, but how many of you have ever taken a personality profile examination for a company or a business that you've worked for, anybody raise your hand. You've taken a personality profile exam. Now, basically what they do, they'll give you this little exam to identify your personality type. They, they want to uh, identify your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, with whom you can be most uh, uh, productive and in what environment. So every time I've taken that test, and I've taken it about three times, I always came out what you call melancholy perfect. Now, that's that particular test. I think in the disc, it's the C. But melancholy, perfect. Now, melancholies are, are uh, by nature, and I've been in this a long time, so I've learned to harness this, per this man. <laughs> but melancholies, by nature, are somewhat moody. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, one day it's like, woohoo! And the next, <laughs> yee hee! I mean, it's just up and down, you know? My wife is just as even as you can imagine. It's such a blessing. <laughs> but, you know, melancholy is in the natural, kind of given to moodiness and because many times of our perfectionistic tendencies. Now, your creative personalities, your writers, your musicians, and different ones, they tend to be on that melancholy side. And, and I don't know, I was just born this way, you know, uh, this perfectionistic thing. If, if everything's perfect and ducks were in a row, happy camper man. But if things were out of order in disarray, it wasn't going as planned, man, it would steal my joy. I liked all my shirts hanging properly. The, the pants have to be on the same types of hangers. You know, the underwear, the, the socks. I used to uh, vacuum and mop the garage. I couldn't have any weeds in the flower beds. The, the hedges have to be meticulously manicured, you know. And, and, but I want to tell you something. After a wife, a mother-in-law, two kids, a cat, and a dog, forget it. <laughs> it's not going to be perfect. Life isn't perfect, right? And so guess what you have to do, man? you got to learn to change tracks and sing a different song. And that's what I learned to do in life personally. I said, you know what? I can be miserable or make everybody else miserable, or I can change tracks and sing another song. And that's what I did in life. And so when the alarm goes off, instead of, oh, God, say, whoa! <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice. <laughs> I'm going to be glad in it. Everything I set my hand to today is going to prosper. You say, Brother Marty, do you feel like that when you get up? No. No. You don't always feel joyful. I was kind of like that guy. You ever had seen those coffee cups? They have three lines. The top line, when the coffee's full, it says, shh. 
Then the next line down in the middle, it says almost. Then at the bottom, it says, now you may speak. <laughs> Anybody like that? And then don't raise your hand. <laughs> but I was like that. But man, you got to change tracks and sing, sing a different song. You don't always feel joyful, feel peaceful, but joy's in there. It's been deposited, right? So what you have to learn is this, and this is a very good principle. Emotions are more powerful than, what was I going to say? She got me ticked. Emotions are more powerful than reason, right? Now, what do you mean emotions are more powerful than reason? You can have a person that is involved in a destructive habit a bad relationship, reason screams, stop, get out, change course. But the emotions associated with many times overrides the reason. So emotions are more powerful than reason. But guess what? Here's an equal law. Action is more powerful than emotion. That's a psychological and spiritual reality. Action is more powerful than emotion. So here's the conclusion. You and I will never be able to feel our way into acting differently. I don't feel happy. I don't feel like I love them anymore. I don't feel like coming to church. I don't feel like raising my hands when Pastor Joni says, praise the Lord. I don't feel like it. I'm real. I'm not going to put it on. You're real, real carnal. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Actions more powerful than emotion. God said if you'll put on that praise, that heaviness will dissipate. Because action's more powerful than emotion. So sometimes, man, your joy settles to the bottom of the glass. You ever had sweet tea? I'm in Texas. Do y'all have sweet tea? Now, I'm from Georgia. We have sweet tea. That means you steep eight or nine tea bags, and then you put in, while it's hot, a minimum of a cup of sugar. Minimum. Then you stir it up, and it dissolves quite nicely because it's hot. Then you add the ice and the water for your gallon of tea. <laughs> but now I go up to New York and different places like that. And I'd say, I'd like some sweet tea. They bring me a cold glass of tea with a jar or those packets of sugar. And then you've got to put it in there. And where does it go? To the bottom. And you go, stir it up. <laughs> Aggravates me. Because it doesn't all dissolve. You know what I'm saying? Well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes Times your joy settles to the bottom of the glass. And when it does, you've got to stir it up. And God said, hey, I got some spoons for you. <laughs> what are they? He said, well, you can shout for joy. We read that. You can shout for it. Now, everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout it one more time. I mean, sometimes, man, when the world's pressing down, I just go down into my man cave, my basement. I lift my hands. I start shouting praises to God. Do you feel like it? No, I don't. But I do it. And I begin to magnify God and tell Him how awesome He is and faithful you are and how I love you. And I just start shouting praises. And, man, that stuff starts bubbling up on the inside. Why? Because it's resident. I just had to stir it up a little bit. How many of you give me five more minutes? Anybody? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I know you got to eat lunch. But anyway, so talking about shouting, I had a, um, we used to serve as associate pastor at Raymond Bible Church. We came in from church one night, my wife and I. And so, man, the minute I hit the door, I had, I had what you call an, a burden to pray, an unction. So, man, we started praying in the Spirit, in intercession. We went into the, in the den and started praying in the Spirit. And we prayed, you know, 25, 35, 45, 50, 60 minutes, an hour or so. And all of a sudden, when you pray something through in the Spirit, through intercession, if you don't know about that, you'll learn. But in intercession, once you've got the answer, even though you may not know in your natural mind, Paul said, if I pray in the Spirit, I pray, you know, 
with the understanding and also in the Spirit. My spirit's praying, but my mind's unfruitful. So sometimes when I'm praying in the Spirit, I don't know exactly what I'm praying about. But when I know I got the answer, something on the inside, man, it's like a note of victory. And I mean, you might shout, you might dance, you might sing. Well, simultaneously, we hit that note of victory, my wife and I, in the living room. And I mean, I started dancing and I was going all around that, that living room, you know. And I had a little dog, his name was Snickerdoodle. <laughs> He was a little shih tzu. He's, he's gone home to be with the Lord now. But anyway, no, he was laying on the ottoman, just minding his business. And I don't know why in the world I did this, but I was dancing. I said, I, all of a sudden, I said, whoa, like that, and I touched Snickerdoodle. God is my witness. <laughs> that dog, he jumped up from the ottoman. He started running around the kitchen table. <laughs> I said, honey, look, the Holy Ghost is on that dog. I'd never seen him run so fast. Somebody say, shout for joy. You can shout for joy, man. You can sing for joy. You get up in the morning or you get out off of work, but if you get up in the morning and get in the shower, just start singing a happy song. I'm full of joy. And I got the victory. I'm full of joy. Now, that's about as far down as we fellas go, isn't it, boys? About right here. We kind of let the runoff get the rest, don't we, guys? I'm full of joy, and I got the victory. And you just keep singing a little bit. And what do you do? You're stirring that joy up. By the time you get out doing your hair, I'm full of joy. You are full of joy. You were full of joy already, <laughs> right? You just didn't know it, but it's in there. You activated it. You stirred it up. So you can sing for joy. You can leap for joy. You can shout for joy. But now we're closing. Here's one of my favorite manifestations. And it's in Psalm 126. Notice what the Bible says. Psalm 126, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. Right? Our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, Man, the Lord's done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. So one of my favorite manifestations of joy is not the only one, but it's one of my favorites, and that is laughter. Everybody say, ha, ha, ha. ha, ha. Now, contrary to popular opinion, Reverend Mark Hankins did not create the phrase, ha, ha, ha. In fact, in fact, you know, I travel with Kenneth E. Hagin. Some of you will know who he is uh, for many years. And we had what we call an annual uh, uh, winter Bible seminar in Tulsa, Oklahoma there. And so, uh, you know, I'm the praise and worship leader. In the 90s, in the 1990s, friends, there was a tremendous outcome pouring of the Holy Ghost in joy and saturation. You can probably get on YouTube. I think I got one called, uh, I don't know, it went viral. It was like uh, just one dose of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's probably 20 something years ago, but I still can get happy. But anyway, man, there was such an outpouring because the body of Christ had become so dry and, you know, so God just visited. And I mean, there was a joy, there was an outpouring, there was a celebration. So one night we're in Winter Bible Seminar, 8,000 people there with the overflows on national satellite television. And I mean, people are all over the floors, what we would term in Pentecost, drunk in the spirit, just saturated with the presence of God, laughing, dancing, you name it. You know, we understand God's multifaceted friends. We understand the holiness of God and, and being on your knees and worshiping Him. But He also is multifaceted like we are. He is a joyful God. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with the oil of gladness. So He's full of joy. That's why He wants us to be, right? So anyway, He says to me, Brother Hagin's up on the platform. The service is coming to an end. And he said, uh, he looked over the microphone in front of all those people, looked at me because I'm the worship leader. Brother Marty, do you have a song that will fit in here? Into that? Now, you've got to understand, Brother Hagin was what we would call in New Testament dispensation a prophet and a teacher, Ephesians 4.11. And so, he always told us as a prophet, he said, now, if you sing the wrong song at the wrong time, it will kill the anointing. Now, who wants to be responsible 
for killing the anointing on national television and in front of 8,000 people. I didn't. So this great man of faith and power said very, very confidently, no, sir. I said, no, sir. Well, he looked at me right over the, right o- you know, said right over the microphone. He said, well, you will by the time you get up here. <laughs> and so all the way up, man, there's a lot of steps up that plan. All the way up, I'm going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Give me, give me a song, Lord. Give me a song. Give me a word. And all of a sudden, you know Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. All of a sudden, these words started bubbling up, and I've taught you this. But these words were ha, 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 he, 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 hey. <laughs> Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Ha, 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 he, 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 hey. I resist you, and you cannot stay. And it had, you know, some verses to it. And the band came up, you know, the trombones and all the band. And the singers came up. And I don't know why it came out this way. But it came out like one of those old tavern drinking songs. (laughs) And it was, ha, 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 he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ha, 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 he, 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 hey. I resist you and you cannot. St- Y'all sing it with me. You know it already. Ha, 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 he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ha, 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 he, 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 hey. I resist you and now sway a little bit and sing it, everybody. Oh, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey, I resist you. One more time. Let's sing it again. Hey. Singing, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey, I resist you and you cannot stay. <laughs> Listen, I will tell you something. I got to tell you, I'm telling you the truth, and I don't mean this disrespectfully in any way, but 8,000 people started singing that. And the more we sang it, the drunker we got in the spirit. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but the, the, the Lord never intended you to go through this life sober. <laughs> now, he said, now, don't be drunk with wine. That's the wrong substance. But be filled intoxicated with the person, power, and presence of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So listen, here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to have ourselves a good laugh before we leave. You mean we're just going to laugh? Yeah. You don't even have to have a sense of humor to laugh. Every person is is born with the gift of laughter. God put laughter on the inside of us. I mean, let me ask you something. When you laugh, where do you laugh from? Your head? (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Is that where you laugh from? No. When you laugh, where do you laugh from? Your belly, from your heart, from your spirit. Because God created laughter. So we're going to have ourselves a good laugh. You say, well, now, now what are we going to laugh at? Well, I'm glad you asked me. Here's, here's something you can laugh at. Now, I understand the context of the Scripture that we're about to share with you. Uh, Job 5.22, I understand the context. You know, Job's had a rough time. His comforters are there. They say, listen, we know that you've been, ti- you've been through a rough time, but you're going to look back on this man, and you're going to laugh. And so it said, at destruction and at famine, thou shalt laugh. When it looks like destruction, when it looks like everything is falling apart, man, It looks like famine. Hey, we not going to have enough? Ain't no way. Let me tell you what I've done. I mean, God's my witness. I've gotten my checkbook out, put it on the desk, and I've just laughed at the zeros. (laughs) You're telling me that you've really laughed at your checkbook? I sure have. It beats crying about it. You know? And I, I just laugh as an act of faith because I know everything's going to be. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. So here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to get in your mind's eye something you need to laugh at. Man, I don't care if it's financial, physical, relational. Uh, we used to have people come to healing school with terminal diseases, and the Spirit of God would begin to move in this joy and laughter. And man, they'd start laughing, laughing. They'd never been in a service like that in their life. Fall on the floor sometimes, just belly laughing. <laughs> And get up, God is my witness, get up healed. And many times it's because that laughter released all the fear and the stress and the anxiety, and that healing began to flow, right? My wife and I, we tried for about eight years to have kids, and they said, you have unexplained infertility. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Unexplained. So you know what we did, man? We just laughed. Ha, 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 ha. Now, that's not all we did. You understand that. But we did laugh. <laughs> ah, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> oh, we finally got those two precious little girls. Amen. Hey, listen. So I want you to get in your mind's eye something you need to laugh at. Now, I'll tell you about famine because we got to go. But, you know, my mother-in-law, she's lived with me, I, be, I guess, 18 years. Huh? Okay. Uh, about 18 years. And so she's been a widow since she was 40. But right when my wife and I got married, uh, we were trying to get some things financially set out, you know, in, in an order. And so we were up against some tough times. And so she's on the phone with us. I'm talking about laughing at famine. And she's a Bible believer, you know, and praying with us. And so she's counseled, and we've prayed, and she's about to hang up. Now, my mother-in-law's from the deep south. I mean deep. You've got to have an interpretation for her colloquial expressions. So she said, now, honey, one thing about it. I said, what, Mom? I was waiting on her words of wisdom. They can't eat you. I said, what? She said, they can't eat you. They might can take the car, take the house. They can't eat you. You'll live for another day. I don't know why that blessed me, but I just ran around the house. They can't eat me. They can't eat you. <laughs> you might need to remember that when the bills come due. Just turn to your wife and say, well, they can't eat us. Turn to your neighbor and say, they can't eat you. Glory to God. So listen, I want you to get in your mind's eyes something you need to laugh at. I don't care what it is. And on the count of three, I'm going to leave you, lead you in laughter. You say, now we're just going to laugh. That's right. Now, now you might have to prime your pump. You've seen those old hand pumps that you pump, you know, and, and first you're pumping it, it goes, but you keep pumping and then all of a sudden you hit a gusher, those old wells. Well, everybody's got joy in your well. You might need to pump a little bit this morning. Ha, 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 You just keep pumping, and then you'll hit a gusher. Are you ready? I don't know if I'm going to be able to count. Okay. So here, get in your mind. I got something I'm going to laugh at right now. Right now, personally. If I can count. All right, you got, I want you to get in your minds out. Now, don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at me. Whatever it is, instead of speaking to them out, we're going to laugh at it this morning. Are you ready? One, two, three. Oh. 
I love all the different kinds of laughs. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Some of you need to laugh. The bell devil's been beating you up lately. Just keep laughing a little bit. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Don't you love all those laughs? Woo! Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> pumping keep priming <laughs> I've never heard one quite like that <laughs> I know people want to laugh sometimes they need a little help. So I, I bring what you call jump starters. You ever read those bulletins? The bulletins, you know, in the Baptist, I was raised Baptist. We had bulletins, and some of you do. They, they make announcements, but sometimes they have misprints. Have you ever read that? Like one of them said, don't let worry kill you, let the church help. Like this when it said uh, the sermon this evening what is hell come early and listen to our choir practice <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy <laughs> oh Lord now <clears throat> This is a good one. Don't worry, Jesus is not offended because I asked him about this. But it said, the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon this evening, searching for Jesus. <laughs> I like this one said, uh, this being Easter, Easter Sunday, we're going to ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, Lord. Okay, I'm going to give you one for the road, then I'm going to sing you a song. It said, uh, Bertha Belch, a <laughs> A missionary from Africa will be speaking tonight at Calvary Memorial Church. Come tonight and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. <laughs> Oh, Lord, have mercy. 
Somebody say ha ha ha. ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. Hey. Everybody stand up. I'm going to sing your song. T, is it CT or TC? <laughs> TC. Crank it up, brother. I've got joy. Start it on zero over there. <clears throat> Woo, somebody say it again. Ha, ha, ha. ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. he, he, he. Hey. hey. Go ahead and start it when you get it now. Come on. Woo. Give me a little more. Hope I don't hurt your ears. You Got to get the party. Listen now. Well, maybe you can tell it by the smile on my face. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. It's a smile that comes from heaven that the world cannot erase. I've got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Sunshine or stormy, you'll still hear me say, I got joy. I got joy. I've got joy. Yes, I've got joy. Hey! With trouble all around me, I can sing Amazing Grace. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Hey, problems cannot stop me. I'm gonna win this race. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Straight to my spirit, provider and friend. Can't help but shout it and say it again. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Listen now. This joy is not dependent on what I feel or see. No matter what the struggle, I still have victory. This joy for my journey, no man can take away. The joy of the Lord is my strength today. Well, Jesus is the solid rock I'm standing on today. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Ah, oh, He's taken all my burdens and washed my sins away. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. When I rise in the morning, see the day God has made. Sunshine and stormy, you'll still hear me say, I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Yes, I got joy. Hey, I got joy. I got joy. I've got joy. Yes, I've got joy. Oh, I've got joy. I've got joy. Does anybody in the house have some joy? I've got Ooh. joy. Amen. Well, I know you got it. Now just walk in it. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Aren't you happy now? You can always feel it if you'll do it. Glory to God. You know, some of you tapped into the Holy Ghost. You know, there's a laughter in the Spirit that's deeper than just, I'm laughing. But many times you won't get there. You won't tap into it until you do it in the natural. And that's what just happened. Some of you might have just done that for the first time. And if you didn't, and you don't know what I'm talking about, just know that there's something deeper. I had seen people laughing in the spirit before and my sharp brain said, I don't, I don't know if I've ever done that. I don't know if I've ever felt what they're feeling. And so I began to want it from God. And I began to get a little frustrated that I wasn't doing it. And I'd see people in services laughing and dancing and doing some stuff that just looked a little bit supernatural. And I thought, well, I want to be able to do that. I want to know what that feels like. And I began to, to desire it and seek the Lord about it. And every meeting I was in that had something like that, I was like, well, what do I do now? How do I do that? And I didn't know what to do until one time it happened to me. And I laughed so deeply in the spirit. 
it was, it was amazing. I, I could hear myself laughing in the spirit. I was on the floor laughing so loud, thinking about what am I doing? It, but it was coming from so deep and it was so special and so, so precious and powerful from way down in the spirit, not even in my belly, but way down somewhere else in the kingdom was coming up this anyway. So it's there for you. Is there, you got to get out of your skin, get out of yourself, let the spirit come upon you. And that's why doing some things kind of starting off thinking about something to laugh at helps you tap in deep because it's very real. Just it's very real. And you know me, I'm not one to be flaky or extra about just about anything. I married Blondie for that reason. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Nothing can stop us. The devil's defeated. Destruction loses. The Christian is victorious. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. Ha, 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 Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.